Bom dia a todos e muito obrigada pela oportunidade de participar desse simpósio e ter ao meu lado o Dr. Charles Nelson. Dr. Charles Nelson é o professor de, de pediatria e neurociência na Escola de Medicina de Harvard, membro de Harvard Graduate School of Education e professor de Departamento de Sociedade, Desenvolvimento Humano e Saúde na Escola de Saúde Pública de Harvard. Ele é também professor de pesquisa a médica, a pesquisa médica em pediatria de desenvolvimento no Hospital da Criança do, de Boston e diretor de pesquisa na Divisão de Medicina de, de, de Desenvolvimento. Dr. Charles Nelson participa dos comitês de, uh, do Center on the Developing Child da Universidade de Harvard e da iniciativa Cérebro, Mentes e Comportamento, Comportamento. Ele é membro de uh, the American Psychological Association e da American Association for the Advancement of Science. Recebeu título de doutorado honorário da Universidade de Bucharest por seu trabalho junto aos órfãos romenos, reconhecido internacionalmente como líder na área de, de neurociência do desenvolvimento cognitivo. Dr. Nelson Diversa, uh, realizou diversas descobertas importantes na ciência de entendimento do cérebro e desenvolvimento comporta, uh, comporma, comportamental durante a infância. Nas últimas duas décadas, Dr. Nelson tem focado sua pesquisa no desenvolvimento e bases neurais de, da memória, reconhecimento e processamento de, de objetos, rostos e emoções e plasticidade neural. Ele tem particular interesse em como as experiências dos primeiros anos da vida influenciam o desenvolvimento. E nesse contexto, estudou crianças de desenvolvimento normal e aquelas com risco de desordens neurais. Seu trabalho mais recente trata de identificação de crianças em risco de desenvolverem autismo e crianças que passam por privações psicossociais, através do Bucharest Early Intervention Project. Passo agora a palavra para o Dr. Charles Nelson para a apresentação da palestra Como a Ciência Contribui para Melhores Políticas Públicas para a Primeira Infância. Dr. Nelson. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm delighted to have been invited, and I hope I don't disappoint. Let me begin my comments by saying that I am not a policy expert, and so uh, 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 later in my talk, I'll attempt to relate science to policy, how we've translated science to policy, but I need to confess that I'm really not an expert in that area. Uh, one other point of c uh, confession is, uh, for in 25 years of teaching, every class I've taught, the students always say I talk too fast, so if I'm talking too fast, let me know, and I'll slow down. So, here's an outline of my talk. I'm going to begin by briefly introducing how experience affects brain development, focusing particularly on postnatal experience. Uh, and then I'm going to focus specifically on a project that, that Dr. Young just referred to, which is the effects of early psychosocial deprivation on brain development. And the reason I'm doing that is it is, in, in my experience, perhaps the one study that has most rapidly been translated from science to policy. And towards the end of my talk, I'll give you some of the examples of how, what those policy changes are and try to broaden this discussion beyond infants brought up in institutions to infants and children experiencing other forms of adversity. So let me begin with some principles of brain development, assuming that many of you are uh, either, your, your knowledge of this is rusty or you actually haven't been exposed to basic neuroscience yet. So let's start with genetics. We know that genetics supplies the basic blueprint for brain development, but that experience then adjusts that blueprint and shapes the architecture of the neural circuits according to the needs and distinctive environments of the individual. So the way we think of this is genes provide the outline of brain development, but it's experience that then fills that outline in. And it does so based on the individual child, not children generally although there will be common uh, uh, phenomenon across children. So for those of you who haven't seen this, this is what the brain looks like across different stages of prenatal brain development. So this is the 
the brain at 15 and a half weeks after conception, of a, a 15 and a half week old fetus, 22 weeks, 23 weeks, 25 weeks. And let me pause here because uh, my understanding is that Brazil, uh, although it was making great headway, still outside of Sao Paulo, has a fair number of infants who were born three months prematurely. And this is what the brain looks like when you're born three months prematurely. And then just look a few months later. And the point I'm trying to make here is that these are infants who were born now and getting experience outside of the womb when they were expecting another three months of experience in the womb. And great strides have been made in keeping these babies alive, but still many of them suffer from it, uh, various disabilities, emotional behavior and cognitive problems. So let's now turn our attention to how the structure of experience works its way into the structure of the brain. So let's begin with the premise that individuality is the product of both personal experiences and biological inheritance. So what makes each one of us unique is what we have inherited from our parents and from their parents and their parents as well as the specific experiences you will have after you're born, and in some cases, before you're born. So genetics specifies the properties of neurons, brain cells, and neural connections, synapses, to different degrees, in different pathways, and at different levels of processing. But because many aspects of the individual's world are not predictable, the circuitry of the brain relies on experience to customize connections to serve the needs of the individual. So one example of that is that we assume that we, when we're born, we will be able to hear what's going on in the world and see what's going on in the world. But if a baby is born who is deaf or who is blind, that makes development very, very different. And so, or take a, a less severe case, a baby is born with cataracts or their eyes cannot focus on an object. Uh, some of you have seen this, this is strabismus or amblyopia, where the eyes might wander. With, if you don't correct that at a certain point in development in the first few years, you will always have a visual deficit in one eye, and perhaps in some cases in both eyes. So the point is, it's our biological inheritance and the specific experiences we have that make us who we are as individuals. So experience shapes these neural connections and interactions, but it does so within the constraint imposed by genetics. So again, genetics provides that blueprint and it provides some constraints, but within those constraints, experience really does the rest of the work. Another point to make is that experience is the product of an ongoing reciprocal interaction between the environment and the brain. There's a common misconception that young children are sponges and they simply absorb what happens to them. And to some degree that's true, but really what they're doing is interacting with the world. So in some comments I made at a meeting yesterday, in the United States there was a, a, a company that was making a set of vi videos to make you have a smarter baby. They were called Baby Einstein, and they were designed to stimulate your baby's brain development. And many parents thought that if they just sat their baby in front of the television and played this DVD, their babies would start to speak in three different languages and become much smarter. But what babies need is that interaction. And uh, one example of that is in songbirds, that songbirds learn the, so the song they're going to sing from the father. They have to learn it from the father actually singing to the baby bird. If they watch a videotape or hear an audio tape of the bird singing, their song is abnormal. And humans are the same way. We learn about language by interacting with people speaking to us, not just listening to it on television. So that's what I mean about an ongoing reciprocal interaction between the environment and the brain. So specific experiences vary enormously under identical environmental conditions depending on the history, the maturation, and the state of the individual's brain. Brain maturity has an impact on experience. So different areas of the brain, different areas of the nervous system mature at different rates with lower level processing areas maturing earlier than higher level. I mean by that, for example, that our ability to see and to hear and to touch and to smell and to taste develops before our ability to talk and to remember and to uh, plan for our future. So it's sort of a bottom-up approach to development. So a less mature brain is uh, affected largely 
by more fundamental features of the environment, so for example, patterned light or speech, whereas a more mature brain will be affected by higher level things such as your best, having an interaction with your best friend or uh, interactions with the teacher. As the brain matures and changes with experience, more detailed aspects of the environment begin to influence it. So we move, for example, from being able to tell the difference between different speech sounds to starting to be able to reproduce those sounds, to being able to say words, and then to string words together to make sentences. So as an individual's brain changes, particularly during these early developmental periods, the same physical environment can result in very different experiences. The impact of, the ex of these experiences on the brain is not constant throughout life, however. Early experience often exerts a particularly strong influence in shaping the functional properties of the immature brain. And many neural connections, the, again, what we referred to earlier as synapses, pass through a period of development when the capacity for experience-driven modification is greater than it is in adulthood. And what I mean by that is that early in development, experiences can have a much greater impact on some systems than they will later on. And of course, one example is our ability to see. So uh, if we, if we uh, are exposed to a normal visual world, will start to develop normal visual ability. But it's not as though when you're 30 years old, you can become, have extra better vision. You can have LASIK surgery to correct vision, but the point is that you don't suddenly see better because of experience. So these experiences that occur early in development are referred to usually as sensitive or critical periods. Now, I use both terms, but I want to briefly illustrate the difference between them. For many years, we used the term critical period, but critical period has the, uh, brings with it the assumption that at the end of this period of time, n experience can no longer have any impact at all. So uh, for the last few years, Professor Shankoff, who was here last year, and, I, and he and I taught an undergraduate class, and a student in the class came up with a very clever way to distinguish between critical and sensitive periods, something that many of you will find familiar. You're rushing to make a plane, and you hit a lot of traffic. I'm sure that never happens in Sao Paulo. And just, you get to the gate, and just as you get to the gate, they close the door to the plane, and the gate agent says, sorry, you missed the plane. Now a critical period would be, that's it. You're not getting on that plane, you're not gonna get to your destination, there are no other flights, no amount of begging or bribing will get you on that plane. You've missed that window of opportunity completely. But a sensitive period, one I have a lot of experience of in air travel, is I get to the gate and the, and the door closes and then I burst into tears and say, please let me on, my dog is dying, or I mean I make something up and they might let me on or they say, tough, you're late, but there's another plane that leaves in an hour. So with extra effort, I manage to get there. And that's one way to think of a sensitive period. So in human development, many aspects of development, I think, are regulated by sensitive periods, not so much critical periods. In animals, it's much more regulated by critical periods. So uh, what happens when critical experiences are, lap are lacking during critical periods of development? The classic way that neuroscientists have studied the role of experience in brain development is to observe what happens when the organism is deprived of certain experiences. Now, with animal models, which is really what dominates the field, the way to do that is you can do selective deprivation. In classic studies done uh, at Harvard in visual, uh, in visual development, they took kittens or monkeys or rats and they, um, well, they sutured their eyes closed, basically. They, they sewed their eyes closed, so they didn't have any visual experience. And that was one way to look at that. In the human, you can take advantage of so-called accidents of nature. Children who are born with cataracts who have the cataracts removed. Children who are born with a hearing impairment but then have a cochlear implant that allows them to hear. Um, in the study I'm going to talk about today, I'm focusing on one, uh, well, in a sense, one particular type of deprivation, early psychosocial deprivation as this, I think, is a good model system for the millions of children around the world who experience profound neglect. So to put this in context, before I go to the slide, there are, by some estimates, 70 to 100 million 
orphaned children around the world. The figures I got yesterday for Brazil is that there are 3.7 million orphans in Brazil alone. There are at least 8 million children who grow up in institutions, and of course, there are hundreds of thousands and millions of children who experience profound adversity early in life. They're maltreated, they're abused, they're neglected, and so on and so forth. So the work I'm going to talk about really is simply a model system for understanding a dramatic form of, of adversity or a dramatic form of deprivation that occurs early in life. And this project is referred to as the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. Now before I go on, am I speaking slow enough? Because to me this is really hard to talk this slow. Is, are we okay? Can I speed up a little? All right. I won't, I won't speed up. I won't speed up until the end and I run out of time and then I have to get through the last slides. Um, so the brain requires wide-ranging input during these sensitive periods, linguistic or language input, cognitive input, social input, and the like. And experience exists on a continuum. Some children are reared in environments that provide all of their needs and others are reared in environments that provide next to none of their needs. And so the study of institutionalized children represents a model system for understanding the role of experience in brain development, as these children are generally profoundly deprived of most experiences. So what do we know about children reared in institutions? We know that they're at a much higher risk for a variety of social and behavioral problems. This includes Disturbances in social relatedness and attachment. Uh, how many of you have a uh, background in psychology? Oh boy, okay. That, not as many as I, Do you know what attachment is? Okay, generally you know what attachment is, all right. Uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Deficits in IQ and what are called executive functions, higher cognitive functions. A syndrome that mimics autism. And I say mimics autism, it's referred to as quasi-autism because it looks just like regular autism, but it can go away when kids are placed in a family, so it's not the same as autism. And then profound growth stunting, and so I'll give you an example of this. Um, tell me, what's your best guess as to how old these ch children are and uh, if they're boys or girls? And please do it in English. <laughs> Five. And boys and girls? Okay, so this is a 17-year-old girl, and this is a 14-year-old girl. These kids are not in our study, but the point is that children who grow up in institutions, even when they have an adequate nutritional environment, are profoundly growth stunted. They generally lose about one month of linear growth for every month they spend in an institution. So these children are like this not because they're malnourished, but because they're, they don't grow because of deprivation. And it's, it's psychosocial dwarfism is one of the terms sometimes used to describe this. Uh, Jason, are you, is anyone keeping track of time? Well, you don't have to keep track of time. I mean, I could stay here all for, okay. I just want to make sure I don't, you know, overstay my welcome. Um, so why might institutionalization be bad for the brain? So the care generally is insensitive. Um, th these are I individuals, this is a job, they have 15 or 20 kids to take care of, the caregivers, and they're really not very sensitive to the needs of their in the individual children. Uh, it's very regimented daily schedules, so children take naps at the same time, uh, toilet at the same time, eat at the same time. An example of non-individualized and insensitive care is the way kids are fed is often a child is propped up in the arm and the caregiver just shovels the food into the mouth. They don't look at the baby or they don't look at the child, they just shovel food into the mouth. Um, there's a lot of isolation, uh, so there, and there's no response to distress. If One of the eerie things when you walk into an institution is how quiet it is, and one of the reasons it's quiet is that children have learned not to cry, because if they cry, no one pays attention to them. Uh, there's a lot of unchecked aggression. You'll see a group of four and five-year-olds playing, and, but usually playing by themselves. And if another kid bumps into them, they'll take something and you know, hit the kid in the head with it. So there's a lot of, and it's unchecked because there's no one there to tell the child what they've done is wrong. Um, 
there's really a big issue, I think, is a lack of psychological investment by the caregivers. So unlike growing up in a family where parents invest a lot in their kids, uh, here the caregivers really don't invest anything in the individual kids at all. There are rotating shifts so that uh, one, care, one set of caregivers is there from, say, 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, and then there's another set and then another set. And so the kids, on average, can see have dozens and dozens of caregivers over the, over the first years of life. And there's a very unfavorable ratio of kids to caregivers. So what that means is that for kids under 2, there might be 15 kids to take care of for one caregiver. Um, as they get older, it gets even worse, maybe 20. And so here are some examples of of this. So these kids are all uh, toileting at the same time. And I want you to pay close attention. You notice several of them, their eyes are crossed. And an observation we've made that we still don't fully understand is the prevalence of strabismus is quite high when these kids are little. But you see less of it as they get older. And it may be that when they're young, they spend most of their time lying on their back staring at a white ceiling with nothing to help them practice eye movements. And so the muscles of their eyes get a little weak. Um, here you can see a bunch of kids all strung together. Um, I'm pointing out these three kids. These three kids are all in their mid to late adolescence, the 15 to 18 years of age, although they don't look anything like that. These kids are in what's called a neuropsychiatric institute. They've been pretty much left there because they were considered handicapped. And then here's an example of kids lined up in cribs just sitting next to one another, and they'll stay like this for the first one and a half years of life. So, in this project I'm about to talk about, we conducted a randomized controlled trial of foster care as an intervention for early institutionalization. And here's how this worked. Uh, this work is being done with two colleagues in the United States, Charles Zena uh, uh, at Tulane University, who's a child psychiatrist, and Nathan Fox at the University of Maryland, who's a developmental psychologist. We uh, went to Bucharest, we built a laboratory, we did a feasibility study to see that we could do this, and then we tried to find a large sample of children under two whom we considered to be pretty healthy. So we, did, we looked at about 180, 190 children, did pediatric exams on them, and we screened out kids who had obvious fetal alcohol syndrome, an obvious chromosome, genetic, or neurological disorder, and were left with 136 children that for the most part seemed pretty healthy. Now, later on, we learned that we were, this was not a perfect solution, but the point was that we did want to begin with a group of kids who were, for the most part, looked pretty normal to us. So we did an extensive baseline assessment on them when they were, on average, about 20 months of age. The children ranged from 6 to 30 months of age at the baseline. Went through a, a very extensive assessment. I'm only going to talk about a few findings. And immediately after the baseline, we randomly assigned half of these children to a foster care intervention that we had to build ourselves, and the other half were randomly assigned to remain in the institution, what we call care as usual. Now, one question that comes up is, how could you deprive care or the intervention to half the sample? There was no foster care in Bucharest when we started. We had to uh, figure out a way to start it. One reason there was none is that there was a strong cultural bias against children. Uh, the assumption was that the only people who would take a child into their home not related to them biologically was a pedophile. So there was a strong sense, also there was a strong sense that the state did a better job of raising kids and families. So that's one of the reasons, two of the reasons why there was little foster care. So we did extensive advertising and we eventually had a sample of parents who agreed who expressed interest in being foster care parents. We did an assessment on them to determine if we thought they would be good foster care parents. And after all was said and done, we identified only 58 families in the whole city that we thought would be good foster care parents. So we placed 68 children in the 58 families because we kept all the siblings together. So that's how we could not provide care to everyone because there was only 58 families to go around. We have a policy of non-interference, which means that over the course of the study, we fully expected children to change their original group assignments. So in other words, uh, the 68 children who began life in the institution, at the age of 8, only 14 still lived in an institution. The authorities started to take kids out, put, re reunite them with their biological family, uh, put them in government foster care, which started later. I'll come to that later. Kids in our foster care were reunited with their biological families and the like. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is, for those of you in public health or epidemiology, it, all the data I'm presenting today adopt what's called an intent-to-treat design. And by that I mean, 
We analyze the data based on your original group assignment, not your current living circumstances. So if you're in the institutional group and you're in the foster care group and you're now eight, although only 14 of you still live in an institution, I analyze the data from the original 68 assigned to that. And the reason is it avoids sample bias. We don't know why some kids leave institutions and the like. So our findings are a conservative test of the role of early experience. If we were to fail to see differences, it could be because it's where the kids are currently living that's most important. But as you'll see, almost all of our findings are accounted for by what happens in the first few years of life. Was that little lecture on public health and epidemiology clear? Okay. So for the baseline findings, I'm just going to go through a few findings. Let's start with IQ and brain. So for IQ, the, uh, the average IQ of the children in the institutional group at baseline is about 74, whereas it's about 100 in a group of kids. We had a third group of kids who never lived in an institution. They just lived with their families in the city, in the greater Bucharest community. So what this is showing us is that our IQ measures worked in Romania as they would in the United States. We had a, a population mean of 100. But the kids in the institutional group had an IQ of 74, which puts them in the sort of uh, mild to moderately mentally retarded range. Now let's turn to brain. Uh, one of the early brain measures we used was EEG. And the EEG is simply we, we can place sensors on the head and record the brain's electrical activity. And what, let me walk you through this here. So this is baseline again. The top is our institutionalized kids. The bottom is never institutionalized. This is the nose, the back of the head, the left ear, and the right ear. So I'm, this is a top view, front, back, left, and right. Now, what these color maps reflect is that as you move to the red spectrum, you're showing more and more brain activity. You'll notice in the never institutionalized group how much red activity you see over the frontal part of the head. And you'll notice almost the complete lack of this in the institutionalized group. So the children who are institutionalized show a profound reduction in the brain's electrical activity compared to the never institutionalized children. Now let me turn to the intervention effects. So now what we want, now the kids were randomly assigned to foster care, now we're going to start tracking their development after they've been in this foster care intervention. So we'll do IQ and brain again. So let's now turn to the first question. What happens, DQ refers to developmental quotient, it's a proxy for IQ. What happens to this at 42 months of age for all three groups? So this addresses the question of, is there an intervention effect? So now the IQ of the institutionalized group is 77, it's no different than it was at 74. The IQ of the never institutional group is 103, but notice the IQ of the foster care group is 86. We've raised IQ by nine points for the group as a whole. And this is a big difference at a population level. So I'll give you one example. The, these data were published in the journal Science a few months after another paper was published on IQ. How many of you are firstborns or only children? OK, some of you. Uh, not surprising if I do this at Harvard, 75% of the students raise their hand. Um, in this paper, in a huge sample of you know 20,000, they found that firstborns had almost one IQ point more than secondborns or thirdborns. So those of you who raise your hand, you can tell your younger siblings that you are smarter <laughs> by one IQ point. But one IQ point isn't, <laughs> doesn't make a big difference functionally, but nine points can. But now the more interesting question came along, which is the following. Now that we've demonstrated an intervention effect, now we want to know does the, does the influence of foster care vary as a function of how old you were when you were placed in foster care? And this is the idea of a sensitive period. And now if you look here, you'll see the answer to that is yes. The children who were placed in the first 18 months of life have IQs that are in the mid-90s. And the children placed in un, under two, 18 to 24 months, have IQs in the upper 80s. Actually, these are not actually different. But notice the difference in the IQ of kids placed after two years of age. They're back to the mid-70s, the same as a never institutionalized group. So what that's telling us is that if you're placed before two, you have a much bigger bump in IQ than if you're placed after the age of two. 
Now, what about brain activity? So let me walk you through this slide. So remember, CAUG refers to care as usual. That's the kids in the institutional group. Again, top, uh, sorry, left, right, front, and back. Remember, we're looking for more red than anything else. Oh, but how would I sit? <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to disclose that personal confidential note you gave me. Can I, can I sit here? Working? Okay, so here's what I want you to notice. The EEG in the institutional group is identical to the EEG of the kids placed in foster care after two years of age. Similarly, the EEG of the children placed in foster care before two years of age is the same as the kids in the never institutionalized group. So as we saw for IQ, we see a sensitive period. Children, now, and this is at eight years of age, when only 14 of the kids still live in an institution. But we analyze this with intent to treat. So what this is telling us then is that as late as eight, we still see a sensitive period. That kids placed before two have what looks to be something like normal brain activity. Kids placed after two looks like the brain activity of kids who never left the institution. So institutionalization is a very detrimental effect on cognitive and brain development. Foster care appears to be effective in improving cognitive function for those kids placed before two. Duration of time in foster care does not influence timing effects. What I mean by that is when I said children placed before two show the biggest effect, we also looked at how long they had been in foster care. That didn't account for the findings at all. It was how old they were when they went to foster care. So timing is everything. So now we wanted to account for this reduction in EEG. I want to make two observations. First, we saw less EEG. The other thing I haven't mentioned is we also saw that their heads it, were not growing very fast. In fact, the children in foster care, if they were placed before a year of age, had a dramatic catch up in their head size. But after a year of age, their heads grew, but at a much slower rate, and their head circumference was smaller. So now we have children with smaller head circumference, less brain activity, and what we wanted to know is what's going on in the brain. So we did magnetic resonance imaging. This is what this looks like. And um, the question is, perhaps children have fewer brain cells or connections between brain cells. So to look at this, we did this. And here are the data. I'll try to slowly go through this. This is gray matter. Gray matter refers to basically cell bodies of neurons, not the connections or anything like that, just the actual body of the neuron. And uh, we're looking at the left and right hemispheres, right and left hemisphere. So for the institutional group, Here's the amount of gray matter. There's no difference in the left and right hemisphere. You notice that it's the same as the kids in foster care. I'm not sure what happened to my slide. This is supposed to say foster care group here. And how much more gray matter there is in the never institutional group. So now what we're observing is not only a dramatic reduction in gray matter in the institutional group, but we're not seeing an intervention effect. The kids placed in foster care are not showing more gray matter. But that's different than if we look at white matter. So here's the amount of white matter in the institutional group, and here's the amount of white matter in the never institutional group, which is much higher. But notice foster care is now in between the two. So we are showing an intervention effect for white matter. White matter would be that coating of myelin that sits on some axons, and it's important for information transmission, and we can also explain our EEG findings with these white matter findings. So. Early exposure to institutionalization early in life leads to reductions in brain size. It has a differential effect on gray versus white matter, with gray matter being more affected by foster care intervention, uh, sorry, more unaffected by foster care intervention than uh, white matter does. So profound early neglect leads to dramatic changes in brain structure. White, but not gray matter, shows improvements in after placement in a family. So, let me start to uh, draw some uh, to talk about some uh, more behavioral domains which might be more interesting to some of you rather than the brain findings. Still okay for the rate of speech? Okay. No, I should go faster, is that what you're saying? Okay. I'll try to go a little slower. So, 
Let's turn to attachment. Um, so I think many of you, if you don't even know scientifically what this means, you know personally what it means. It's that relationship young children develop with a caregiver. And one way to look at this is you can classify the children as having a secure attachment or an insecure attachment. And I'll show you a movie of this in just a minute. So what you're looking at here at baseline is the following. Uh, this is the percent of children never institutionalized who have a secure attachment. And this is the percent of children in the institutional group that have a secure attachment, hardly any. If you turn this around for insecure, this is the percent of kids in the institution with an insecure attachment, and here is the percent with a secure attachment. Let me give you an example of an insecure and insecure. So this is sometimes done using a, a procedure called the strange situation. So the way this would work is, um, oh, if I walk, you can't hear me if I walk around. So um, mom comes into a room with the baby. Mom sits in a chair, there's some toys on the floor, she puts the baby on the floor, and we measure to see is the baby playing with the toys, are they moving away from the mother a little bit. Then a stranger walks in the room, and you observe what the baby does when the stranger enters. And what many children do is they keep playing with, they look up at the stranger, say these are 18 month olds or 12 month olds, but they might get a little closer to the mother. Then the mother leaves the room and the stranger sits down and you observe what does the child do now when left with the stranger, and then the stranger leaves the room and the baby's left alone, what does the baby do then? And then the mother comes back in the room and you observe how does the baby react to the mother. A secure attachment, a standard scenario. Stranger comes in, mother's still there, baby gets a little closer to mother. Now let's say they're 18 months old. Mother leaves the room, stranger sits down, and the baby makes a beeline for the door, bangs on the door, cries, wants its mother back. We don't let this go on too long because it's awful to see. Um, and then event, and then the, the stranger leaves, and then the mother comes back, the baby grabs the mother and you know, hugs the mother, and it's like, where have you been my whole life and I've missed you. An insecure attachment, there are different types of insecure attachment. One would be the mother leaves the room and the baby doesn't even notice. Um, but when she comes back, she's happy to see them. Or she gets very upset when the mother leaves, but when she comes back, she gives her the cold shoulder and she doesn't pay attention to her. So those are different types of, uh, and it's perfectly normal behavior. It's just considered to be an insecure attachment. I'll talk about the pathological form of this in a few minutes. Now, let's look at the intervention effect. Only focus on the middle panel here. Um, so, this is the per these are only foster care data. This is the percent of kids, 70% of the children placed in foster care before the age of two show a secure attachment, whereas after the age of two, 70% show an insecure attachment. So they're mirror images of each other. In other words, as we discussed with EEG and IQ, kids placed before two show, are much more likely to show normal attachment behavior. After two, less so. So we did a functional measure of this, something that isn't as awful as the strange situation. Actually, it's much worse. Um, and it's called stranger at the door. And we did this when the children are four and a half years of age. And here's how this worked. The caregiver and the child answered the door when a stranger knocks, and it's prearranged that the plan is Stranger will knock at the door and the caregiver lets the child answer the door. And then the stranger says to the child, come with me, I have something to show you. This is sort of every parent's worst nightmare, right? And all we're measuring is, does the child walk out of the door with the complete stranger or do they stay behind? Let's start at 54 months. If you look at the children in the community, the never institutionalized group, there was one child that left. We're still worried about this one child. <laughs> if you look at kids in the institutional group, um, I can't see the figures even here, I can't see the figures, but this is the percent of kids who left with a complete stranger. Did, can anyone see that f number? I think it's like 60%, but I'm not positive. If you look at kids in foster care, notice the difference. Many, many fewer leave, but still, if you look at the trend, in the institutional group, this percent left, foster care, this percent community. Still, there's a dramatic difference. Uh, many fewer kids in the, institutional, in, the, in the foster care group 
left than, than um, institutional. At eight years, we still see this. Now at eight years, right, it's not uncommon to go off with a stranger. You're going to school, you meet strangers a lot, but still, this is the percent of kids in the never institutional group who will not walk off with a stranger. Here it is for foster care. Here it is with the institution, or reverse it, the ones who did leave with it. So even more of the institutionalized sample left with the complete stranger. Remember, at eight, only 14 kids still live in an institution, but we looked at the data from the original 68 assigned to the institution. So this is, again, a dramatic example of the foster care effect on attachment. Let me now turn to a pathological form of reactive at of, of attachment disorder, which is called reactive attachment disorder. Is this familiar to any of you? All right, so here's, there are two types of this disorder. There's the emotionally withdrawn and inhibited child, and these are children when, in, when around their caregiver, or really almost anybody, will freeze and become completely inhibited and not move. In contrast to the indiscriminately social child or disinhibited child who will, who will go up to anyone the first time they've ever met them. So if you could start this video, I wanna show you how we looked at this. This boy's 18 months old. <laughs> This looks very touching. Uh, it's a, a great reunion episode, except that this is the first time he's ever seen her. And this is what I mean by indiscriminate behavior. So he's never seen it before. He just jumps into her arms, and he will do that with anybody. Um, so that's the disinhibited type. Here are what the data look like. If you look at uh, the line way down here is the, is the prevalence of this type, withdrawn type, reactive attachment disorder for the kids who've never been in an institution. And it's, there's almost none of it. You just don't see this in typically developing kids. If you look at the black line here, these are the kids in foster care. And you notice that by the time the kids are 30 months and then a little bit after that, the rate of this type of attachment disorder has disappeared. It's no different than the never institutionalized. But look at the kids in the institutional group. All the way to eight years, they still show an elevated risk. So the kids in foster care, pretty quickly, by 30 or so months, this goes away, but it takes much longer to go away and it doesn't completely go away in the kids in the, um, in the institutional group. But now look at the disinhibited behavior. Again, he, here it is in the never institutionalized group. And it's a little high at baseline because some, some 18 to 20 month olds don't show this behavior. They will, they will show, they'll walk off with a stranger. But you notice it completely disappears after that. But now here's the difference. The black is the kids in foster care. And you notice how much longer it's taken to diminish all the way out at eight years, it's still elevated, but it's not as high as the kids in the, care, the institutional group. So what this is saying is that the intervention we did, foster care, was very effective in getting rid of the inhibited type of reactive attachment disorder, but the disinhibited type is much more resistant, and that is the, what the scientific literature tells us generally. Many of the many kids that you see this behavior in when they're a year or two of age, you'll still see this when they're adolescents, which is terrifying because that means you have 15-year-old girls going off with complete strangers because they don't know any better. Um, and finally, if you want to look at timing effects for just the indiscriminate behavior, these are the kids placed under 24 months, and these are the kids placed after 24 months. So most of the effects are accounted for by timing. We can pretty much get rid of even the indiscriminate behavior if the kids are placed in a family before two years of age. Again, the idea of the sensitive period. So, uh, attachment is profoundly compromised. Foster care ameliorates uh, some attachment disturbances. Earlier foster care is disproportionately more effective. How am I doing for time? Do I have another hour? 
oh, so I don't have to worry right now. But if I don't make eye contact, I won't be able to see how much time I have, right? Okay, I'm just going to ignore you. <laughs> so let's turn to psychiatric morbidity. So what is the prevalence of mental health problems in our study? We waited to do this until the children were 54 months of age um, because that's when we felt we could do a structured psychiatric interview. So what we did is we administered what we call the preschool age psychiatric assessment or the PAPA. This was developed at Duke University. We translated it and back translated into Romanian, trained our staff to do this. And it's a structured interview that you do, usually it's one of our psychologists doing this with the caregivers. Um, so I said that. So what we want to know is at 54 months, did the foster care intervention decrease the rates of psychiatric disorders for ever institutionalized children? Let's start with the bad news, which is ADHD. So the gray here are the institutionalized children. Remember, this is 54 months, and at 54 months only 20 kids still live in an institution, but still we analyze it using intent to treat. 23 or so percent of these children have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I don't simply mean symptoms of, they have the formal diagnosis based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The kids in foster care are, look a little different, but these are actually not statistically different, which means there's a very high rate of ADHD in kids who've ever been in an institution and foster care had no effect at all on diminishing the rate of ADHD. You notice it's only about 3 or 4 percent in the never institutionalized group. I think in the United States, it's, the population mean is about 7 percent of kids, almost all boys, have ADHD. So it's a little lower in Romania. Uh, what about disruptive behavior disorders? So these are kids who are very difficult to control. Okay, 20 minutes, that's it, said. Uh, it's, no, really said 10 minutes. Uh, so now I have to talk really fast. So for disruptive behavior disorder, some of you know what this means. These are kids who are really out of control. They're very hard to manage. Again, no difference between these groups and the prevalence is up in the 12% range of our sample. So collectively, we think of these as externalizing symptoms. ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder. The intervention had no effect. But where it did have an effect was in internalizing problems like depression and anxiety. The first thing to note is how that 4% of the institutionalized children met criteria for major depressive disorder, which is mind-boggling when you think about it. That's very high. But we cut it in more, more than half for the kids in foster care. If you look at anxiety, the bad news is, again is almost 45% of our sample suffered institutionalized kids met criteria for a major anxiety disorder and that was cut more than half by kids in foster care. The last thing I want to note are the gender differences which we almost have not observed in any other domain. If you look at the care as usual kids you notice that there are more boys who, who have some psychiatric symptom than there are girls and if you look at foster care the girls have much less prevalence of a, of a symptom than the boys do. So what I mean by this is that in general, even in kids institutionalized, girls don't suffer as much as boys. And for the kids in foster care, girls benefit more than boys. What baffles us about this is that we know boys are more vulnerable to things like neurodevelopmental disorders but we were surprised at this difference in psychiatric disorders because you usually don't see this in four and five year olds. Uh oh. I, I pushed the wrong button by accident. Can, thank you. So, higher rates of psychiatric disorders and impairments in children who've been institutionalized compared to children in the community. No significant difference in the rates of ADHD and behavior disorders in children in the institution versus those in foster care. Children in the foster care group had significantly lower rates of emotional disorders, anxiety disorders, reactive attachment disorders, and the like, than children who remained in the institution. Being a girl may be a protective factor. And there was no evidence of timing effects on the rate 
psychopathology. So unlike the other domains I talked about, here it didn't matter. If you got put into an institution, sorry, if you got put into foster care at any age, you became less anxious and less depressed. But conversely, regardless of how old you were when put in foster care, you still retained your externalizing problems like ADHD. So, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go back and stand up. Brain development, brain development. Brain development begins a few weeks after conception. Most of the brain architecture is laid down in the late prenatal period and the first few postnatal years, but adult brain is not evident until early adulthood. Early experience exerts a powerful effect on brain and behavioral development during so-called sensitive periods. What happens early can a have a lasting impact on the years later, including adult mental and physical health. So, for example, 30% of adult psychiatric disorders can be accounted for by the exposure to early adversity in the first years of life. And this is what we mean by the effects we're observing are not just short term, they can, they can uh, damage children for 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. So let me now close by turning my attention to policy. Uh, there was an ethical issue in this study, as there is in all randomized controlled trials, which is that if you're doing an intervention and you, s you begin to realize that the intervention is working very well, let's say it's a drug you're using for diabetes or it's a device, you are faced with an ethical conundrum. And the, the standard would be you provide the intervention with, to everybody. So in our case, about a year or two into the study, we realized that how, how much the kids in foster care were benefiting. But if we, we couldn't uh, give the intervention to everybody because, because there weren't any more foster care families. So the other option is, well then, ethically you could stop the study. But if we did that, everyone in foster care would go back to the institution. So what we did instead is we worked with the U.S. Ambassador to Romania and called a national press conference to, to which we invited not just the press, but everyone in government. And we announced our findings to the government and basically said, raising kids in institutions really hurts them and putting them in families, particularly before they're two, can really help them. This also happened to be around the time Romania was uh, looking to be led into the European Union. And in short order, based in part on our study, maybe even more than in part, a number of changes came about. They passed legislation forbidding the institutionalization of any child under two unless they had a lot of handicaps. They began to close down institutions. When we started in the year 2000, there were more than 100,000 kids in institutions. And when I was there a few months ago, that's the figure now is 22,000 live in institutions. They began a network of foster care parents, so now there's government foster care. Um, based on these findings, um, our foster care program is being exported to other countries. Uh, Uganda is one, Bulgaria is another. So people are starting to benefit. We've consulted extensively with uh, UNICEF and other organizations towards closing down institutions. And in fact, in June of this past June, the European Union had a meeting where they were considering EU-wide legislation that would lead to abandoning the practice of institutionalizing parentless children throughout all of Europe. Um, and again, uh, we, there, when you walked into this meeting, there was a sign that had the Bucharest Early Intervention Project right on it because it provided the scientific evidence to support these changes in policy. But there were some unintended consequences. I'm almost done. Um, one was that in Romania, this rush to deinstitutionalize children meant that the government hadn't really considered changes in child welfare and child protection. So many children were placed with their biological families who didn't really want them, and there was almost no monitoring these families. We had kids who were put on the doorstep of their families, and that was it. Um, so they hadn't put into place a good child protection system, and they hadn't really consulted with the biological families if they wanted their kids back. Uh, the government started establishing foster care, but they didn't put the resources necessary to make good foster care. We've analyzed the kids in our foster care compared to the kids in government foster care, and the kids in government foster care don't do nearly as well as the kids in our foster care, which was very, very high quality, and admittedly more expensive. But I think if an economist looked at this, they would find that first we do know 
that raising kids in institutions is more expensive than putting kids in foster care, but we'd also find that the gains kid made in kids make in foster care will benefit them for years to come rather than being remaining in an institution. Uh, and the government failed to put an effort into preventing child abandonment, which is the big issue. What leads parents to abandon their kids to begin with? So uh, five years ago, there was a drop in the number of kids institutionalized, but UNICEF told me that the rate of child abandonment hadn't changed. So I thought, how could that be? If the number of kids being abandoned is the same in 2005 as it was in 1985, where are those kids going? Well, they're not calling them institutions. They're calling them small group homes or things like that. So Romania had failed to put a lot of efforts into preventing parents from giving up their kids to begin with. And so this is what I consider to be sort of unintended consequences. Um, the last thing that is disturbing to many is that under political pressure, in 2002, the government banned all international adoption. So since there was little in the way of domestic adoption, this led to many children being placed in foster care, which is really temporary placement. We want kids to be put into a permanent home. This was an entirely a political issue, not a policy issue. And as a result, it meant that children could no longer be adopted into permanent homes if they were out of the country. And the only exception now is if, if it's a native Romanian couple out of the country, they can adopt. So the bottom line is let's learn from the science Let's inform policymakers, politicians, and clinicians about the disadvantages of raising children in institutions and the benefits of raising them in families. And let's inform these same groups that there are lessons to be learned from this project that extend to all children at risk for substandard parental care. So we know that the duration of time and early adversity powerfully influences later development. And the age of the child when removed from this adverse environment and placed in a good home will also be very critical in influencing the outcome. And uh, early adversity can have lifelong consequences. So the first years of life are important. If I can, this I have no time to show this one minute movie. This is a really good movie you're now gonna miss <laughs> because she told me I had to stop talking. The end, thank you very much. <laughs>